just running through your mind endlessly now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> everybody, great stuff. All right, so we're live. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, hello to the August 2023 uh, CodeWorks thesis project presentations. Um, we have gathered here today um, to watch the thesis projects of our current senior group. Uh, so these students have been working on what we call our thesis project, uh, thesis project for the last two weeks, where we challenge them to work as a group to create a, a full stack application, the front end, the back end, everything that sits in between, uh, of their own design. It can be anything they want. So we've got some really, really cool apps uh, to look at today. Uh, and we are joined, want to hear some, some, some nice cheers from the campuses now, but, but not too loud Berlin, or you're going to go mute again. Um, so let's say hello. Let's get a big wave from the London campus. Hello. There they are, and excellent. And let's get a nice wave from the Berlin campus. Great energy in Berlin today, love it. Uh, and let's get away from the Barcelona campus. Hey. <laughs> and of course, away from all the remote students, everybody else. How's it going? Excellent. Everybody's looking energized and not at all exhausted. Um, <laughs> I should I should say that's a, the. These, uh, these, this group have done fantastically well. It's really, really hard work doing the thesis project. So to turn up and make a make an excellent video and bring some good energy is a challenge. Um, so I'm I'm today being ably assisted uh, by one of our instructors, Seb. Uh, Seb, who, where, which video are we going to see first? It's an excellent it's an excellent question, John. Um, first of all, I have lined up for you a nice uh, game to get the cogs in the brain turning. This is real-time trivia app from right here in London, a combo of London and remote students. This is from Tiago, Alex, Carlos, and Atai. Oh, they're coming in for some questions over here. You might see some people bundle in the room with me. And here we go. I think I think we're lacking That's, sound, Seb. When when sharing, you you have to say that it should share the sound as well. When screen sharing, I am sharing sound. Is the strange thing, but let's start that again. Maybe maybe it needed a maybe it needed a a moment. <laughs> <laughs> no. I haven't even seen it. On the hook. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, somebody yeah. Has, somebody's coming. Oh, I think there was some sound there, right? I think so. You yeah. Select the audio output. No, I think we have sound now. Yeah. Wait. <laughs> no, that's not good. No, no, there's supposed to be sound. No. And on the use. We're going to zoom. Is... Yeah. If you click on it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's a good thing we're all software engineers, right? Look at this. <laughs> yes. Just play it out loud on your phone. Yes. OK, maybe that makes a difference. Bear with us. How many software engineers does it take to unmute Zoom? <laughs> We're going to find out soon. OK, here we go. Here we go. Right, I can click to join the room, ready to start the quiz at the mm -hmm. Yep. Sound. OK, cool. Cool. And we're golden. OK. <laughs> Yeah. Hello. Did you know I aced that history trivia night at the bar last week? Oh, please. I could beat you at any day, at any time. Really? Haven't you heard of real-time trivia? No. What's that? It's the ultimate trivia battleground. Think you can beat me there? Challenge accepted. When you first go to our page, you arrive at the auth page. We have a login and a create new account option. On the create new account, you have to enter the email, username, and a password, which you have to repeat. And we can just submit here and we're in. So here we'll log in with a host account so we can make a quiz. 
and on my user i'm just going to add some quizzes that i'd like to participate in from the discover list and here we can see that they've been added to my upcoming quizzes on the host side i can see all of the quizzes that i'm currently scheduled to be hosting and join one by clicking it and on the user side i can click to join the room ready to start the quiz at the scheduled time when the countdown reaches zero we're redirected to the user stream page uh, as the host we start the video start the stream which enables us to join the stream from the user side <laughs> We then start the quiz as the host. For the demo purposes, we've uh, sped up the question timer to two seconds. The users then answer the questions as they pop up on the screen. Uh, the, you, the host also has the questions available so that they can read out loud as the quiz goes. On the final question, when the answers are revealed, the final score for the user is also revealed. Seeing real-time trivia is powered by the Aruba Tech Stacks. We've used the Next.js with TypeScript, integrated the GWT for our authentication, and PostgreSQL for our database. And with WebRTC, we were able to provide seamless real-time experience for our users. And all other the tech stacks you can see around here. By the way, our application is designed to be progressive web app ensuring optimal user experience across both web and mobile platform. Building a real-time trivia was a learning curve, with which we navigated the complexity of real-time application design. Team collaboration was key, and with each new challenge, our problem-solving skills grew stronger, shaping us into well-rounded developers. Very nice, cool app. Righty. Let's have a nice big round of applause for that group. Well done, everybody. <laughs> London are being a little bit too loud there. Um, that was really cool. So this group's tutor, if I'm not mistaken, was Jerry. Do you have some feedback for this group, Jerry? Jerry. <laughs> You're not muted. Buddy. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, it was a pleasure tutoring this group. Uh, it was an ambitious tech stack, really cool technology technologies in there to web sockets web rtc um really smooth how it ran as well the entire week um the product is well very solid app already deployed um with continuous integration deployment lined up as well um really well done incredible project congratulations guys um yeah, so I prepared some questions to you guys. Um, we, we've heard about the, the cool technologies you've worked with. Um, the one that is probably the most interesting to, to our viewers and the junior students and every programmer in the room is WebSocket, something that is becoming more and more important. Um, could you talk a bit, whoever wants to take the rein here, uh, could you talk a bit about your experience and learnings that you had from your interactions with, with WebSockets. How easy was it to, to, um, to engage with it? How solid was it later in the project? Yeah, so um, I guess I'll tell you this one. Um, yeah, I think uh, luckily we'd actually, on the legacy project, we got introduced to WebSockets really uh, in depth for the first time. Um, so we had a little bit of a base to go off, which was great because we used them a lot in this project. So if I hadn't have had that legacy project to get a little warm up, I don't think uh, it would have turned out as smoothly. Um, but yeah, in general, I think once you really understand the basics of the web sockets, it's actually pretty simple and now yeah, I, I find them relatively easy to implement, just as easy as any other kind of HTTP request or, yeah, 
And using that uh, to control the WebRTC we've got going on was, that was a little bit more tricky at first because uh, the WebRTC side was completely new to all of us really. Um, but so yeah. that's the, the video handling, right? The live yeah. recording and sharing. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, it, uh, having the experience in the legacy made it not too bad. Yeah. How how, how was WebRTC here more or harder to get into? Uh, what was the 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 tricky part about it? Um, <laughs> I'd say the trickiest part was understanding what the hell is going on. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's so different to uh, anything really we've done before. Um, and it's a weird protocol because it's all based on signaling. So you're not really dealing with the uh, web RTC directly. You're more just signaling with uh, web sockets to control that protocol. Um, but yeah, once you get your head around how everything is meant to meant to work, it's it's not too bad. All right. Um... Thank you. Now, so you you are deployed, if I understand correctly. This web is available online on, please remind me of the URL. <laughs> Real-time-trivia.app. So real-time-trivia.app. But, it All right. <laughs> but let me warn you, it doesn't currently work on <laughs> the deployed uh, on the deployed website and it's funny you asked about web sockets because uh the web sockets in uh, local development great um in deployment we've had a little bit more of an issue <laughs> yeah all right um good to hear so there there's more to content more more uh commits and deployments you you work there with with continuous deployment um so you you essentially have scripts happening on github specifically that continuously deploy the main version or the main branch of your repo. Um, how did that go? How how hard was that topic to get into? Well, um, <laughs> yeah, I guess that's another one for me. Um, <laughs> I, well, <laughs> I think if I hadn't had uh, some help along the way, it would have been really tricky because uh, the basics behind it pretty simple but actually implementing it and getting everything to run correctly and smoothly is a whole different ball game really <laughs> and in that regard you could essentially rely on um, examples that that were provided during the lectures if i understand yeah, that correctly that, that was the that was the basis behind uh behind it all yeah fantastic now we we had it was on deployment <laughs> we had here a, a mixed team um, with London students and, and remote students. Uh, how did you organize this, this collaboration, this communication between uh, those two, well, this distributed campus uh, group? Uh, well, um, I'm not sure uh, who's best qualified to take that. I mean, uh, I... <laughs> no, uh... Or I can take it. Uh, Sounds good. Yes, we, we organized. Uh, it was uh, kind of different because two of us were obviously on on campus and two two remote. So yeah, they on campus they had better communication between them. But we we always we always talked. Uh, had a meeting in the morning to decide everything that we were going to do that day to talk to talk about everything, and then one. At the end of the day, then during the day, if we had some questions, we need to to know uh, anything from the other. We would we would get together, but it was basically that we would get assigned what we would do, and then at the end of the day, we would recap and we would try to understand everything to continue the project and see and see what was left. We also worked with. With Trello, with uh, in, on Trello we assigned all the tasks, all the tasks we were coming up with, we assigned them there, and it was that way it was easier to to remember and not to miss out on on any of them. 
All right, fantastic. Uh, last question from my side. So this app looks quite simple on the high level, but if you look under the hood, um, the data model that is being applied here is actually quite sophisticated and, uh, well, relationally complex. Um, I know that Tiago worked on, on this one. Can you talk us a little bit about how you managed to set up such a wonderful data structure underneath? Uh, yeah, um, uh, well, <laughs> it's like today, I mean, yeah, like over the last two days, I realized that it's not quite, com quite complex enough because there are queries that I need needed desperately to make uh, to get some data. And it's like, I'm needing to, do like four levels of querying whereas if i'd actually done the extra step while i was setting it up i'd be able to get the information in one go but the 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 relations that we do have did get us pretty far without we didn't really have to change it once it was established which is quite good um but it did take three three days to get it up um the idea was that you everything is kind of based around uh well, a, a user, users and quizzes and the relation relationship they have. So one user has many quizzes in the sense that they can host many quizzes and they can also participate in many quizzes. But a quiz also has many users as participants. Um, and then quizzes have many answers and answers, sorry, questions and questions have many answers. So everything in the database is relational. Everything is related to each other through one way or another or like circularly <laughs> eventually so it helps with querying when you have relations because you can get the questions and include their answers and manage those two things separately and over the long term never have to be able to collect so much potentially valuable data without ever having to delete it from your database because you're managing all of these things separately so you have a database just for your questions sorry, a table just for questions, a table just for answers. Um, and then you just relate them, which just makes managing them easier, querying them easier. And SQL is really, really cool. And you should definitely use it. <laughs> and I think you, you specifically also used a, a tool to help you in the building process, SQLize UI. Right? Yes, SQLize UI, which gives you a boilerplate TypeScript ready, SQLized, SQL models. Um, so yeah, because yeah, TypeScript needs you need to declare your model types and all of the property types um, before you can declare a model and SQLize UI just helps you spit that out quickly rather than fighting through errors. <laughs> Essentially yeah. you can focus on building the concept of your data rather than building the the in detail implementation. Yeah. That's that's it. All right, fantastic. Uh, I think I've already taken a, up a lot of time, so I'm gonna open up here the the question round for everyone. Mm. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, feel free to put raise your hand in Zoom, uh, and we can get your questions answered. I was wondering if you've done any. I mean, do you have any idea of how many concurrent users you could have in one quiz? That that will be a question for when. Uh... WebSockets are yeah. paving themselves on the web rather than in local development. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, if we could get one, that would be really cool. <laughs> right now. <laughs> well, they've, well, maybe if you, you know, you've got uh, what you've got a week until graduation, so you can oh, you can get thinking. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get, it, get it going, and then we can all graduation. we can all jump on and and do some stress testing for the graduation. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. All right, we got any other any other questions for this group? Uh, or if not, we will. We'll I might have right a on. couple questions for Carlos. I think John, if if we've got time. If of course we have time. What are your questions? Uh, we got plenty of time. Um, Carlos, I loved your. Um, in fact, I've I realised I've just been a fool. My question's actually for a tie. Um, I just wanted to say that Carlos is really dramatic, like camera shots at the end there, breaking down the challenges of real time engineering applications. <laughs> was inspiring. <laughs> But um, was the idea. <laughs> it was very much Alessandro from the early <laughs> June lectures. Um, 
Now, anyway, Atai, I was going to ask you about the PWA thing, because you mentioned that at the end there, there's that bonus clip that you just threw in of like, oh, and also real-time trivia is a PWA. And that's cool. Why did you decide to make it a PWA? And what did you have to do to make it a PWA? So in the beginning, we were just aiming for the uh, mobile applications and designing, designing for that. And at first, when I recorded the video, I just didn't ask for that. And after that, uh, we had some updates to it, some uh, web, web workers as well. So, and that's why we got that uh, officially uh, PWA. So that's why I decided, we decided to add to, to the video in the end. Cool. And like, what was it that, why were you interested in making it a PWA? in the first place just because you could you just wanted to technically flex or <laughs> was there like a a target market you were trying to get get because there? Uh, yeah because code works taught us so that's why we decided to make <laughs> <laughs> cool cool i mean i was hoping that you would have remembered some of the reasons that codeworks had taught you pwas <laughs> were cool but also nice fair play you've implemented the tech well very proud Okay, cool. All right, back to you, John. Nice, good stuff. Well, I think I think probably we should we should move on. Um, but that was great. Let's do one more round of applause for this group. Well done, everybody. Amazing app. Excellent work. Um, and now I think I just need to uh, fill fill a bit of time here while Seb sh shuffles those uh, two guys out of the room and queues up the next video. Uh, so that was an app from and that was a a rare hybrid group. So that was two of our students in London and two students studying remotely um but it was very very cool and Seb, who do we have coming up next yes okay on to the next project now we are jumping over to berlin and we are going to investigate a nice little app called lendify this is from the brains of adam kevin and lena very nice wholesome app changing the world for the better hopefully the sound works first try this time let's go introducing lendify revolutionizing the way you use and share everyday items, making ownership an option, not a necessity. Welcome to the future of lending. We've built a community where users can leverage what they have and access what they need while earning credits and saving money. Manage your belongings and borrowed items, chat in real time with other users, and earn bonuses for contributing to our platform. Join us and let's transform the way we consume and share. After all, why buy when you can borrow? Welcome to our landing platform, where organizing your belongings and sharing them with others has never been easier. Let us guide you through the landing lifecycle step by step. First of all, add your item. To get started, simply upload or take a photo of the item you want to lend. Give it a landing value in credits, which represents its worth in our community. As a thank you for adding a new item, we'll reward you with 100 credits. Secondly, discover and reserve. Browse through our discover page or use the search function to find items that catch your interest. When you find something you'd like to borrow, reserve it. You'll be automatically redirected to a chat with the owner where you can discuss the handover details. Thirdly, receive the item. Once you've agreed on a time to meet with the owner, receive the item in person. After the handover, mark the item as received in the app. This action triggers the transfer of the specified credits to the owner as a token of appreciation for lending their item. Fourth, return the item. Communicate with the owner to arrange a date for returning the item. When you meet up and hand it back, the owner can mark the item as returned in the app. This step concludes the lending lifecycle and the item becomes available for others to borrow again. By following this simple lending life cycle, you do not only contribute to a sustainable and sharing community, but also get the chance to discover and borrow unique items. Remember, our platform thrives on trust and respect, so treat each item as if it were your own and enjoy the benefits of lending and borrowing within our friendly community.
Having a central file as a single source of truth allowed us to know how to build up the project, especially at the beginning when ideas seemed abstract. We separated the tasks of everyone so that no conflicts emerged during the Git flow. Instead of setting up tests early, we manually ran through the life cycle of the user experience many times, only realizing much later that using testing libraries like Cypress speeds this up tremendously. Having only one week to produce our feature-packed MVP pushed us to our limits. But organizing our code into modules and components early on allowed us to solve errors quickly. As always, there's too many ideas and not enough time. We had a lot of features we wanted to implement into the app, which kept growing as we reached our previous goals. Implementing a real-time chat with Socket.io meant that we had to wrap the app in yet another context. Mobile first development meant that we had to think from the perspective of mobile user experience, such as position of buttons and flow of actions. To crush all these challenges successfully, we created a detailed plan of attack. Lastly, having a non-relational database with many relationships added obstacles to finding and returning data to the front end. Although real-time chat was hard to set up, we were able to leverage it to put in a notification feature that allowed the user to see any actions while they were offline. We managed to create an intuitive user flow by reconstructing the con components and their structure. We were able to utilize the power of Mongoose and MongoDB to collect and return data from the back end to meet the needs of the front end. And great communication and teamwork helped us to reach all of our goals. For the back end, we used a COA server with Mongoose as an ORM for the MongoDB and Chest for testing. On the front end, we used React and vanilla CSS, as well as Socket.io for live communication, while end-to-end -end testing was done with Cypress. All right. Very nice. There we go. The really beautiful cool. app. I really, I really love that there was a slide called Triumphs. I think we should, I think we should uh, implement that as standard for everybody. Really, really cool. Um, Aya, you have some feedback for your students. I certainly do, yes. Uh, first up, awesome job. I think it's one of the most feature-rich apps we have seen lately for thesis projects. I think mainly made possible by that huge planning slide. I wish it was on for longer to appreciate everything that had been planned, right? You had database uh, schemas, you had the endpoints on every single a slide representing a page you had a you you had written down at, from which endpoint you can get the data. So I think you were really able to leverage from everyone you know doing their own thing, never meddling with with each other. So I think it's definitely an example uh, to take, um, yeah, to to use for how you work together. I think not a single major. Uh, merge conflict when you were putting it all together, right? Yeah. Just because everyone was kind of doing their own thing. So really amazingly smooth implementation of this uh, huge project. And um, actually there are even some features that don't show up in the in the in the video. I think there are there are more things that they are able to they're able to show in a five minute video, right? I think the only thing that's missing is to deploy it and, and put it into production, no? I hope that that's gonna happen next week. Yeah, Very hard. yeah, that's right. That's good. That would be really amazing. Um, so I think to start with some questions, I would like to uh, give you an opportunity to flex on one of the features that didn't appear in this in the in the video. So whenever you're uploading an image of uh, an object that you want to add to your library, not only can you upload an image, but you can also you know turn on your camera and just take a picture of it. And yeah, maybe you can talk a bit about how you implemented that and you know what that feature is about. Yeah, <laughs> so I said that. Um, yes, it's basically um, something that um, every modern app has um, uh, in regards to social media apps. When you go on Instagram and you want to add a new post, then usually you um, you see a camera view. And then when you um, take a, cam uh, a photo, then you're led to the uh, page where you can enter all the details about the post. 
And in the beginning, we had just a forum and it was kind of boring. So we um, yeah, thought maybe it would be able to implement this camera view first. Mm -hmm. And uh, in reality, it was uh, easier than expected. Mm -hmm. um, there were nice uh, MTM packages for that. Um, I think it was called React Webcam and React um, Drop Zone. Okay. Or also, what we, we've seen in the video was um, this feature where you can press a button and upload mm -hmm. a, um, a picture. Yeah. But um, yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah. So you said, wait, was it React uh, Cam? cam and React it? Webcam. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very nice. So that's a that's a cool feature. And, and also, also, yeah. also you can um if I can add that yeah um you can then view the picture that you've taken and also decline like like go back and take another one. Okay. Like, that was very very nice. Nice. Very cool. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. I think I think uh it's almost a pity that didn't make it into yeah the yeah. I, I, <laughs> it's stressful to do like <laughs> hours. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so right. yeah, and then on uh, kind of a, a well, I guess a slightly different topic. So the previous group was saying how easy it was to implement SoftIO. <laughs> you, <laughs> you had it added in the challenges. So what is what was on your in your specific application? What were the SoftIO challenges? Well, we started with setting up a, a like a database for messages where you could just post a message to and then get the messages. So we had to restructure all of that and make a whole new socket context after we already had implemented the MVP. So this was basically the challenge to restructure and implement it. And yeah, yeah there were some random bugs coming up as always. So okay. Okay, so let's say despite all that planning, sometimes you still have yeah, to adapt. Yeah. <laughs> like I mean, always too many ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was more time and yeah, we went for it. You went so, for it. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yes, the MVP that. in this group definitely kept growing arms and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like stop. I guess the enthusiasm this group is showing here as well, right? Yeah. Um, cool. So that's that's uh, clarified on the socket IO. And then another thing I wanted to ask. Um, so we saw that huge database schema, mm -hmm. and obviously it's way larger than what we would see in exercises. So there must have been some interesting things that you discovered, things you learned, some top um, learning learnings or surprises, favorite features for Mongo working with Mongo and Mongoose. Yeah, I mean, uh, we set up a, a Mongo database, uh, thinking that uh, the user would may or may not upload certain things. So we opted for a uh, NoSQL sort of database. Uh, but doing that, we had to create many relations between uh, each uh, collection. Um, but um, setting it up beforehand actually made it Knowing, knowing exactly what we wanted to do uh, and how we wanted to relate everything to each other, we just had to dive deep into Mongo and realize uh, how to utilize its like deep features. So, uh, for well, example, for example, uh, just uh, um, yes, looking up. Um, for example, looking up. So a user has. Uh, an inbox and the inbox has chats and the chats have uh, items to, and it. items attached to it. So knowing this and having it set up beforehand uh, with not getting, for example, one piece of information, uh, was able to dig through and use Mongo's like deep um, uh, lookup and projections uh to kind of like dig through grab that information sculpt it into exactly what we need to send back to the front end uh but also to update um uh up, update the database like, yeah, one thing like you don't see is like uh we have like a new user uh for example um uh, when you return items and receive um, there's a lot going on, like in the 
in the back of house, <laughs> mm -hmm. sort of make everything work there, a lot of moving parts. And being in the right collection, so. Being in the right collection, yes, yeah. exactly. Removing from the right things. Yeah, uh, but diving deep into the docks and realizing that you don't need a SQL, like a relational database to accomplish these relational uh, issues was kind of cool to kind of, to, to work out uh, and experience. Um, I yeah. guess I guess every instructor at CodeWorks rejoices hearing you saying by reading the docs <laughs> you can achieve all these things, right? <laughs> the answers are out there. Um, yeah, I think I think those are questions on my side. John said anything from you? You can ask first, and then you can ask yours. We have some questions here. We've got TechRag. Oh. And he's loaded with questions. No, just two questions. Uh, wow. First of all, uh, I want to say congratulations to the uh, the Berlin team. A very nice app. And what impressed me most was your app. Like you showed a lot of features and all. And then when you show the text, text, like oh, just the just the stuff that we all know in uh, CodeWorks. So it's like you're doing more with less. I like that. And uh, I just have two questions. The first one is, you mentioned in your presentation you have this uh, single source of truth with one file. Is that Redux or is it a just a normal file? And my second question is, you aim for a mobile first app and did you ever consider using React Native? If you did, why did you not just use it? Yeah. I think the single source of truth was this whole, uh, this huge file we showed where we like um, pre-composed everything and we didn't use Redux, it was more like, to put this into words. So that everyone can look in, into the same thing, into the same Figma file and look at the same, what are the endpoint, uh, endpoints supposed to do? What is the API supposed to return and stuff like Yeah. Yeah. Any other question? Uh, for React Native, uh, we, I did look into React Native. Uh, we thought we would try a new technology uh, like that. Uh, unfortunately, trying to set it up with uh, the uh, firewalls here at WeWork uh, made it quite difficult to, to kind of get it on our phones and stuff. So we opted for React um, to um, not only for simplicity, but in order for us, like you said, uh, to dive deep, to take what we have and go deeper into it and uh, produce more out of less. Thank you for the answers. If Cosas was here, he'll be proud of you because he's, he's not really a big fan of new glossy <laughs> stuff. All right, thank you. <laughs> you're, exa you're exactly right. Costas will be, will be very, very pleased right now. Um, well, we'll try to have a word with WeWork about getting around their firewalls because uh, that sounds like it was probably very annoying. But if it's any consolation, I hear they're going bankrupt anytime soon. So um i think we've got i think we've got uh we've got a raised hand in london nice up guys um i was actually just wondering yeah how you found um like the relations in mongo compared to something like uh you know sqlize or any normal relational database uh, so I took care of the back end. Uh, for my solo project, I did use um, uh, SQL with, uh, sorry, uh, Postgres with uh, Prisma. Uh, I really liked it. I love the structure of it. Um, with Mongo, you can accomplish the same things, but there is a few workarounds that you need to do. Um, such uh, like setting up the schemas, uh, setting up the schemas in such a way uh that i get i guess it's i guess uh coming from the prisma kind of perspective uh you just need to set up like straight away like that each field is related to something else uh, i did find it easier with uh, mongo to set up the relations than with prisma so big ups mongo for that but um, you can accomplish the same things. Um, the only thing is it's not as structured. So I don't know. I'm kind of like in a different pools of thought about which is better, but you can accomplish the same things uh, in each depending on your data structure. 
we went in thinking like there wouldn't be all the details there, which is why we chose Mongo. Great, nice one. All right, good stuff. Um, I was going to say juniors, I know we're covering a lot of like relatively high level stuff here. So if there's anything you don't understand, please feel free to put your hand up and ask people to explain it in very simple terms. Because obviously this is all stuff that you're going to cover, but you might not have actually reached it yet. Uh, so if there's anything that you need to, that you want to understand in more detail, feel free to, to ask people to explain it uh, in, a, in, a, in a slightly more basic way. Seb, you got another question? You're muted. Unmute yourself, Seb. Seb, you're muted. Sorry. I I don't know how I managed to do that. Um, great job, guys. App looked really cool. Um, some of those camera features were awesome. The database design was awesome. The plan was awesome. Um, I've got two, two points. The first of all is the UI looked super crisp, super clean. Usually when you see a UI that's got that kind of crisp, clean feeling, my gut reaction is like, oh, they've definitely cheated and used Tailwind. <laughs> Not that Tailwind is necessarily cheating, but they must have used some CSS library, or maybe they've used like a front-end React component library. Is that a C for component library, Adam? I'm not sure what you're doing. No, that's for Kevin. <laughs> oh, it's to Kevin. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so, but when you showed the tech stack, I didn't, yeah. I didn't catch any CSS libraries or component libraries in there. So uh, yeah. put us out of our misery and tell yeah, us. Just, we were just curious. Though. How did you do that? Um, there is uh, CSS. This is the this, this normal vanilla CSS thing. Ooh. Uh, it, Dad, it, you are loving it, aren't you? <laughs> it pretty much does everything you want uh, if you know how to do it. Impressive. Yeah. Always, I, I don't know. I worked a lot with CSS before, so for me it was easier than with Tailwind because in Tailwind I would have uh, had to look everything up in the documentation. So yeah, I nice. CSS. I've yeah, that's a, awesome. One, I've got a monstrous uh, CSS file. It's all in one file still. <laughs> I will uh, tell so much, but uh, it is kind of structured. And yes, I like cool. it too. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I'm so proud. I feel like a proud dad right now. That very strong foundation. All can say warms yeah. my heart. I love that. That was vanilla CSS. Well done. Maybe just modularize it now. Is the, is the bonus yeah. points. Um, and the, the second thing I wanted to say is I loved the point that you guys made on the insights about how once you set up your end to end testing flow, the whole development process and the iteration cycle became so much shorter because you could change the code. And then you don't have to literally open it up in the browser, type in the things, click around, make sure it all still works. You just run a test suite. And it's yes. one of those things that when you get there, you love it and it's so powerful. And before you've got there, it you, you don't really see the value of it necessarily. But in maintaining open source code bases in larger professional projects and all this stuff, you need that. So I just wanted to see, you know, at what point in the project did you set that up? When did you realize, oh, this end to end testing is great? Not on the first day. We started up today. Like, we, <laughs> we, were, we, were, we were like testing this landing life cycle for ages. It took us so much time to test it. And then we were like, oh no, we need to test it again. And yeah, it, okay, it, it would so. take half an hour just to test one thing. And then today we wrote the test and it took like, I don't know, one minute to go through all of it. Okay, so you learned the lesson eventually just at the end of the project. So I guess yeah. juniors that are listening, there you go. Set up some tests early and you can save yourselves a lot of pain. But you guys made a great app anyway, so there you go. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, no, it's really, really cool app. Um, and I know and I know that I think I'm right in saying that we do have some, some serious Tailwind fans in the other uh, Berlin group. So I'm guessing there were probably some, some, some fun disagreements uh, going on there between the two groups. Um, all right, uh, let, shall we move on to the next project? One more round of applause for that group. Very, very cool. Really, really liking these projects so far. Also really liking um, Seb and Techraj in the same meeting room doing commentary. They're kind of, what are those two Muppets called that are up on the balcony? Uh, like Statler and Waldorf, is that the, that the two guys? So you kind of remind, kind of give me those sort of vibes. Um, anyway, uh, Seb, who, do, who do we have next? Okay, so we are moving to our purely remote group now um, for a project that is all about showing off, sharing your work, 
connecting with other developers. It is known as CodeLink. So here we go. In a digital town on the vast webby bend, I sat at my desk, a message to send. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn and more, yet not one of these touches the coders core. Scrolling and clicking in the vast bitey sea, searching for spaces let, let coders run free. Where do they gather or where could they be? A realm for our projects and tech mastery. Instagram's glittering but misses the mark. Snapchat's fleeting, leaving things stark. A haven I crave, where might it be? For the code in my soul and the techie in me. Just as my hopes were about to sink, on my screen flashed the sight. Code link. Eureka, I cheered, my quest now complete. For coders and dreamers, it's truly elite. A platform so sleek where our skills we can store. A LinkedIn for coders, who could ask for more? Here's to code link, shining and new for tech enthusiasts like me and you. Welcome to code link. This is the homepage of our website. And as you can see, we have an integrated news feed. You can click on the individual news to check the full article for yourself. And right now, I'm not either registered or logged in, so let's just register and create a profile for myself. So I'll just put in my first name, last name, my email, my GitHub username, which is really important because it's the one that we were going to use to fetch the repositories and add to our portfolio, as we will see later. And then a small bio. Um, when I save, you can see that my profile has been created. And when you click on my GitHub username, you are redirected to my GitHub. And as you can see, I have two star repositories, Get Easy and Give Me Movies, which is important because we are going to use this star feature from GitHub to fetch repositories for our portfolio. So if we go back and we add the portfolio, we can see that these two repositories show up. I'm just going to add them both for, for now and save. And then when I click on my portfolio, these two repositories will be there. And I can just delete one of them. And if I check out the project on GitHub, uh, I will be redirected to the repository of that project itself. So here I am back on the CodeLink homepage. I'm an existing user, so I'm going to go and log in. I'm going to authenticate myself with my Google credentials, and then I'll be redirected to my profile. So as you can see at the moment, I have no skills. So let's go and add some skills. You can also delete a skill. Let's go and edit my bio as well. Let's go and check out the discussion board now. So here we can collaborate with other users on suggested projects. Here we can see there's already one project, a collaboration board that we can like, unlike, and comment on. We can also go and add a project. There we go. And then we can just go and log out. As you might have seen, CodeLink is a platform for developers to meet, share skills, find projects to collaborate on, and stay informed about tech news. For that, we used Express, PostgreSQL, Prisma, and Auth0 in the back end, and Next.js based on React on the front end. Regarding the technical insights, we faced challenges and needed extensive problem solving with Auth0. Prisma offered a streamlined and efficient database management compared to other ORMs. There are differences in versions caused compatibility issues, when looking at Next.js. And on a social level, there are benefits from collaborative initialization or a sequential approach where one initiates and others join. And also, don't underestimate the need for clarity on roles, responsibilities, and consistent use of designated tools.
All right, really, really nice. All right. Well done, everybody. That was great. Excellent project. Um, oh. And I think also the 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 first thesis presentation we've had that has started with some beautiful poetry. So congratulations for that. Um, although, although Adam, I would please, please ask you to clean your keyboard. Um, <laughs> John, I realize I'm, I'm a gamer. Is your are you a true gamer if your keyboard isn't grotty? Well, <laughs> fair point. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, no, really, really cool. And this was another one of Jerry's groups, if I'm not mistaken. That is correct. Um, yeah, great app. Congratulations, guys! Great app. Uh, very like solid tech in there. Great design. Um, there were some challenges, as we've seen on the insights as well. You essentially lined me up to to ask a bunch of questions about those, uh, but well done on the progress and well done to sticking through it, even though there were those challenges. Let's start with the first point on the slide, Auth0, what, what went wrong? What is the, or just tell us about your experience with Auth0 and the potential okay. limitations of it. Yeah, um, so Auth0 was a bit of a dream at the beginning. It, it seemed like it was going to be super, super lush, really nice to work with. Um, we got some implementation functionality in place. And then when it came to trying to connect the database, that's when things kind of started to go a bit awry. Um, I mean, we, we managed to get sort of login, log out functionality uh, running. Um, but at the end of it, it, it turned out to be uh, one of the libraries that was being used had not, even though it was an official library, it had not, um, it had not been properly managed and therefore it was missing some functionality, which meant that I was unable to uh, get the JWTs to be able to uh, link to the user pro the the uh, the OI uh, o OIUD uh, I think that's what it was um, to then relate that back to the user in the database. So on its surface, it was it was quite um, a nice little thing to use. But once you started digging down, that's when that's when it gets very complicated very quickly. So. <laughs> Is is then when you left the screen and started writing poetry? Yeah, exactly. I wrote to um, mm -hmm. Doctor Seuss himself, and I said, "Yo, can you just hit me up?" And yeah, he came back to me pretty quickly. Yeah, fantastic poem, by the way. Very. Uh, I don't know if 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 you guys know that, but Johnny Walker used to do. Don't know if they still do them. Advertisement with with poetry felt like in one of those uh, high quality. <laughs> Forgot to mention that in the feedback. All right, so initial setup, great, but then the integration with the database was the problem. All right, good to know for future junior and thesis projects. Um, all right, so you used Prisma as an ORM and you, you mentioned um, essentially its strengths compared to other ORMs or compared it to other ORMs. Could you talk a little bit about why you chose Prisma and what it, um, presents additionally compared to another like SQL ORM, for example, um, SQLize. Yeah, so we went with Prisma because, I mean, everyone knows the pain of working with PostgreSQL and relational databases. Um, Prisma is a really neat way of visualizing all the data you have, all the models, all the relationship. Uh, we basically have users, profiles, projects, comments, likes, and everything is connected and everything works perfectly, perfectly fine. And it's it's really easy to just see all the connections, um, to visualize the data. And also, uh, Prisma has this database migration that basically once the project starts growing and you change your schema, it basically solves all the problems for you. So you don't have problems with tables that are outdated and stuff like that. That is actually fantastic. All right, good to good to know. Um, you also worked with Next.js in your tech stack. I think a lot of people here work with Next.js. Can we hear an opinion on it from this group? 
I think uh, both Miriam and I can answer this question. Um, I think we both had our challenges with, uh, well, as mentioned in the slide versions, the next uh, GS12 version is so different from 13, and that defines the folder structure used to route essentially. So um, we ended up having a kind of conglomeration between Next.js routing and uh, Next.js 13 and 12. So uh, we had essentially you have like an app folder and then a, um, in Next.js 12, you had a pages folder. We had both and we weren't necessarily working with the routing correctly. And um, the other aspect which was new with Next.js was in terms of layouts, um, which is kind of, um, it's a, user interface that's shared between all the pages. And so you have to define that and then use it in each page. And um, that was obviously a new feature. I think we got our head around it in the end, but it makes it a little more tricky maybe to handle state and um, manage re-rendering basically now. Yeah. Although it should make it simpler. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I uh, had that experience myself. They can be tricky next. Um, all right. Um, yeah, Miriam, anything to add? <laughs> all good. Um, yeah, uh, that, those are my questions. Any questions from the audience? Anybody, anybody want to raise your hand and ask a question? Um, I was going to ask, I think it's always the like the learning slide is always really interesting because it's always like an insight into how the project went for that specific group you know so I was gonna I was gonna ask you all um given that given the challenges and the things you learned along the way if you were going to start this project again what would you what would you do differently uh and maybe you can all answer that individually and maybe we'll get some some interesting answers I don't know who wants to take that first maybe Philippa probably probably not move apartments during the project right no, I've I've moved several times during the course, and that is not a good idea. I can say that. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess um, I guess it's just a new thing to work in a group and to navigate a, a like a group of people at the same time as a project. And I think that that was also a really good thing for us to learn as well, because obviously with the legacy project and solo project is a completely different dynamic um so it helped us kind of it was a yeah a learning curve and trying to work that kind of stuff out yeah <laughs> organization Organ organization is always the key one with the thesis project um who else adam what would you what would you have done differently uh i wouldn't have used a uh a, a non-working express library to be honest with you <laughs> it would have made my life a lot easier so that's smart. That's very smart. Uh, <laughs> um, and then who, are, who else do we have in this group? Miriam? Um, yeah, I think I would echo Philippa. Um, it is such an valuable experience to have this social uh, learning also, um, which you wouldn't have if you wouldn't learn coding in a bootcamp. So if I would just do my tutorials at home, I wouldn't be able to make this experience. And there's also a learning curve in, in group working, and that is uh, good to experience nice it's, it's about the friends you made along the way right um and then was there another member of this group sorry i've completely forgot pablo, yeah it's me pablo <laughs> sorry yes what was it what would you do differently uh i mean even though i didn't work on the odd stuff i would probably say not working with odd zero i didn't work with it but it made everything harder in the end so that's it. That's interesting. I've, Alt Zero is one of those things where people either love it or hate it. I've, we've had different projects in the past where people have been like, it's a dream. And then we've also had projects like yours where people are like, never, I would never touch it again. Um, looks like we have a question in Berlin. Yeah, so I've got a question. Um, uh, working in a remote group, I'm curious to know um how you decided to uh like why you decided to work with next.js instead of react and how you got around those challenges uh adapting to this technology like working in uh, a remote group because obviously it takes a bit of time to get used to um, that's a good question who wants to take that 
Yeah, I would just say it's a lot of trial and error. You have to find out how you can work together. It, that is such a new experience. And um, I think a bad thing one can fall into is only communicate about problems. Um, and that's something that is probably uh, special to the remote group, uh, as opposed to you all seeing each other in Berlin, as you have way more communication throughout the day. And um, yeah, so that's a lot of trial and error. And you, it, it takes a bit of time to find a flow there, I guess. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, that's a really nice tip. Don't just don't just complain at each other. Talk about the good things as well. Um, any any of the rest of the group have anything to add to that? No, all good. Uh, Seb, you have a question? Thank you. There we go. We're unmuted now. Um, yeah, awesome. Super nice app. Um, my first question, I just got to put everyone out of their misery. Adam, was that poem AI generated or did you write that? Yeah, it was AI. Uh, uh, and you can just say inspiration hit you and then you just wrote it out. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. I, I, mean, I, had, this, I had this idea of using Dr. Seuss as like a, a back cover and uh, so and I wanted to kind of edit it in a certain way. Um, but I, I just didn't have the sort of time to be able to sit down and write it and it pushed it out. And after a few times, a few mix arounds, I, I got there in the end. It was nice. Yeah, it was delivered exceptionally. So we'll forget. <laughs> I was I would I will I would just say that that's really annoying because I was gonna say that this is the first thesis presentation we've had in about a year that hasn't had any chat GPT AI stuff in it. So I was gonna be like, maybe that maybe that hype cycle's over, but it's uh, it's still snuck in there. Yep. Um, okay. And I also wanted to ask a question just because there was something interesting that you said that I wasn't so sure about. Um, on your insights, I think it was point four of the insights. And Miriam, you were talking at the moment of this. So maybe this is directed towards you. You said the initialization process, the benefits of collaborative initialization or a sequential approach where one initiates and others join. Are you talking about a technical feature here or were you talking about like a management process in terms of collaborating on the project? Uh, more a managing process. Um, yeah. So either you can run into a lot of merge conflicts if it is set up uh, at two different uh, on two different local sites or um, it, yeah, like uh, stuff can sneak in like somebody is thinking about Next.js 12 and somebody's thinking about Next.js 13. Um, and then you maybe not realize it in the, like very fast. And mm. uh, yeah, so that's something um, one should maybe consider a bit more, like how do you set up mm. a whole process and how do you initial initialize um, the different parts of it? Right. So you have a clear plan, I guess. Yeah. You're talking about making these technical decisions and then sort of at the point of making the decision, making sure the whole team is aware of the decision that's being made and knows how to work forward instead of just like, you know, this person's working on that, they make all the decisions, this person's working on that, they make all the decisions, and then eventually you have to sort of cross paths. And so what was it that you found? You found that it was better to align on decisions earlier or that it worked quite well to just have autonomy and let people figure stuff out? Um, I think especially thinking about Next.js, we um, like speaking from my from my perspective now, I thought we made a decision because we chose Next.js because I just was not aware that there is such a big difference between those different versions. It feels like two different frameworks um, in how you set up the whole project and how mm. you set up a project, there's already functionality in there. So um, I think um, we would have needed, like in retrospective, we would have needed to talk more about that in the beginning. Okay, cool. That's a great insight. And for the juniors in the call who don't understand what Next.js is, Next.js is sort of like a framework, like a code base template for building apps and you're writing the React front end library within it. So it's kind of like a big, very popular React tool. And all you juniors will be enjoying your first foray into React next week. Exciting times. Um, otherwise, I just wanted to say, I thought that, again, the stack was really clean. Um, you didn't have that many like technologies that you were working with, which was quite cool. Um, I guess maybe I'm a bit biased and I like being a purist. And it made me so happy to hear you guys say 
No, Auth0 was kind of bad, actually. I think we just wouldn't use it in the future. It's all about rolling your own Auth. You just do it. Just be a badass and just code it all. Who needs Auth0? Um, that is a pure opinion piece. So I, I encourage everyone to do their research before making decisions about Auth. But I just thought it was really nice that you did quite a vanilla stack. You built it up yourself. It's really cool. Um, OK. All right, nice. So let's do uh, let's do one more round of applause for that remote group. Really, really nice project. Well done, everybody. Um, and I think now we're going to move right along to our fourth and final project. Who do we have, Seb? Okay, oh. so um, we've we've saved the most dramatic video for last. Um, this is from our other Berlin group. Um, in this team was Arto, Chris. Elena and Conrad. And I think everyone who knows Elena is very aware that this is this is like Elena's baby brainchild, this this <laughs> app. It's this video is, is crazy. I'm gonna stop addressing, pre pre-dressing, whatever the word is this. I'm gonna let you guys watch for yourselves. Here we go. This is combo breakdown cool. from our second Berlin team. 20 years ago, a video game franchise released a sequel that will change the competitive aspect of video games forever. Street Fighter was the first game coming to what it will be the most important annual tournament in fighting games history, leaving moments like the famous Moment 37. Moment 37. Daigo Mehara was playing with Ken against Justin Wong's Chun-Li. With only one health point, Daigo parried Chun-Li's super move, doing the combat and winning the round in a super epic moment. Oh, that was insane. Lots of EVO tournaments have taken place until today, and Street Fighter has improved a lot since then, along with the players, who studied the character moves, frame by frame, to know if they can execute them or not. And they had to do it just by playing. There was no reliable data source to know the properties of the moves. This year, Street Fighter VI has been released, challenging the status quo of fighting games, which always have been hard to start playing. Street Fighter VI introduced the modern controls, allowing new players to start playing the game without breaking their fingers, while OG players can still use the OG controls. Now, with lots of new players coming into the game, the necessity of having a reliable data source to check the move's properties is larger than ever. And here is where Combo Breakdown comes into the game. Combo Breakdown is the coolest web app for Street Fighter VI that allows players to check the data for characters and moves without the need of turning on the game or going into the training. Check the button sequence of the moves for different platforms like Xbox, PlayStation or Classic Cap Commutation. Change between the classic and modern controls. Compare the frame data of different moves from different characters. All of this in a seamless web app that has desktop and mobile versions. And for those that are especially new in fighting games, they can check the glossary page, where they can find all the terminology explained. But wait, there is more. You can go right now to combo breakdownversalapp and check our demo version. And if you buy the Battle Pass for 1 million cookies, you will have access in the future to new features like checking the frame data of combined moves, scaling damages, and videos of the moves. But now, you must be wondering how this amazing app can be real. So let's dive a bit into that. Combo Breakdown Development Team is a group of four people that haven't slept in the last two weeks. Our backend department is in charge of stealing the data from Capcom's official webpage through scraping methods, process the data, and store it in a way that our app can easily access it. For this, we have an express server deployed on flight.io with continuous deployment. Every time Capcom updates the game data, we can trigger our scraping script through a request to the backend and update our database. Our front-end department is in charge of presenting Capcom's borrowed data using a Next app with TypeScript. The server side of the app connects directly to the database, retrieving all the characters with their moves and feeding the front-end side of the app. The visible part is styled with Tailwind and uses some libraries like Rechart for the bar charts and Headless UI for the animations. We use MongoDB for the database and Prisma as an ORM to access it. 
In combo breakdown, we take testing very seriously, so we have more than 70% of coverage, and we have them integrated in our Git flow for each pull request. We also take very seriously planification and team communication. That's why we use a Trello board to divide the tasks. This way, everyone knows what is the status of the project, what to do, and when is everyone else doing. Also, having daily meetings helps a lot to structure the tasks and divide the work. We hope you enjoyed Combo Breakdown demo presentation and that you are eager to try those moves in Street Fighter. See you in the next week. Street Fighter 6. <laughs> Damn. Very, cool. that was very nice. Good easy. video. <laughs> that was very, very excellent. And I liked hearing Seb's commentary at the beginning as well. And yeah, sorry, I didn't mute my myself. <laughs> uh, that was great. Uh, Aya, you have some feedback for your students. Yes, first up, I recommend that everyone watches this video afterwards because for some reason the music background of the video wasn't coming through. So there's way more drama than you saw, right? So whenever you have a chance to check out all the videos, make this one the first one. And I see Elena is very disappointed. It's going to be hard answering those yeah. questions. <laughs> all good, all good. Um, so anyway, congratulations. Well done. You really tackled the, you know, you took up the challenge to work with a lot of new things, right? So you wanted to explore um, scraping, so you worked with Puppeteer. Then you took up Next uh, next version 13, uh, which kind of, I guess, makes it even harder if you have worked with uh, Next 12 before. So now you have to forget about what's, what you had done before and work on the new things. Um, and then you also decided to use a Prisma with MongoDB, which once again, Prisma for Mongo is a relatively new thing. So a lot of, a lot of technical challenges. So I think, um, yeah, let's tackle those a little bit. However, before we get into that, I also wanted to mention that this team had their testing set up as they were setting up the app uh, from day one. When, next, uh, when the very core of the next app was coming, uh, coming together, they were also already setting up the tests and, and ready to make them and update them as, as, the, as the features grew in the app. So I think that's not something you see very often. So awesome job on that, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well done. Um, so yeah, let's dive into a couple of those um, fun challenges. And the previous group already introduced this idea of how Next uh, 12 is very different from Next 13. And I think you overall developed a bit of a you know love hate more hate relationship with next so maybe i don't know each of you could comment uh, a little bit on uh, how that worked for you and what what were some of the challenges that you found that didn't work the way that you expected or i think sometimes you also discover that maybe the framework is not yet mature enough to do the kind of things you want to do or it was just hard to figure out how to how to implement what you were trying to do so um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. yeah. First of all, uh, Next thirteen is uh, in beta still, so they also don't have all the documentation up. So it has been kind of hard to find out how it works. Um, we had also a lot of problems uh, on deployment with the images, uh, the images that have. Um, dynamic routes um yeah they just weren't there and we have to do a lot of workarounds uh, to make the images appear in deployment but we manage but it's not the perfect uh, way of doing it um yeah but it's basically like you said it's another framework it works completely different uh, than next 12. um i kind of regret it using next 13. I think it would have been easier and uh, faster to develop with the the previous version uh, for anyone else. They, they didn't have experience with Next before. Exactly. So maybe maybe uh, Chris and Arco, you can talk about like experience working with with Next, and do you feel like 
I don't know, do you share the frustration? What were the difficult uh, things for you? Um, maybe talk about how it's different from React and what, what are some things that you didn't expect and how did you approach learning this new framework for, for a project? Did you watch some tutorials beforehand? Did you go feature by feature trying to figure out how to implement it? What was, what was your process to make, uh, to implement this project with a new, ultimately with a new framework? Well, I'll take this one. Okay. Um, well, first of all, we sat down and mapped the project. Um, and then with that in hand, uh, going into the uh, to the docs and, and trying to uh, read into that and what, what we need to grab out of this. Um, again, even the docs are um, frustrating and um, it, um, because they're so similar and also just completely not. So many times you think you're, you you found a solution and you're halfway down a page and, and then you're like, wrong page, like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, you're really happy that you found something, but no. Um, and then also, um, I, I don't know, I'm not a, a you know, next year's 13 expert, but it, it felt like there were like bits missing where it's uh, now is um, you know, any uh, examples? It, well, it's, it's these pictures again, lovely pictures where in our uh, development, um, um, well, look, of course, yeah, lo local, uh, when we uh, like uh, working on it uh, locally, everything works fine. Um, as, so as soon as we push it to, um, uh, you know, as soon as we deploy it, things just work differently. Uh, and it's all the indicators are, are fine, mm -hmm. but it's just not working. Um, and also with, with it being so new, uh, there aren't a lot of Googleable mm. resources. So, so it's hard. Yeah. Um, By the way, I wanted to I wanted to highlight that they deployed the app from day one. As they as they set up the app, it got deployed. And for that reason, instead of facing these challenges of deployments. Once the app is built and you and you try to do it, then they were basically trying to build it as they go, so that uh, I don't know how many times, how often were you redeploying uh, and updating? Uh, uh, every time we do a pull request, it auto deploys. Okay, so there you go. So so basically, every time you change something, you have to make sure that uh, the code is uh, the code can be deployed, right? So I think maybe. Do you feel like that added some extra challenges, um, things that you wouldn't have to, wouldn't have worried about if it wasn't, uh, you know, wasn't being continuously deployed? Um, well, I think the other way around, because we deployed the app from the from first day, mm -hmm. we knew about the image problem from, from the first day, and we had two weeks to work on it. Okay. Because if we deploy, if we have been deployed the app yesterday, mm -hmm. today we wouldn't have any images, mm -hmm. but we have them. Yes, true. That's a that's a great way. That's a great way to see that as well. Yes, indeed. Um, so yeah, definitely something something to take into consideration if you're working with Next. If you want your if you plan your app to be deployed, have it up and running as soon as possible, and and comb these issues out as you go along, right? Ato, I don't know if anything to add on this uh, next 13 thing. Yeah, I would agree that, well, it's uh, the basics is easy to deploy. Mm -hmm. And I think also what Elena said, it's great that we did it in the first day mm -hmm. because then you get instant feedback whether it's fine or not. Um, otherwise, yeah, there was a lot of stuff to learn, but uh, and I will never forget the image struggle, but uh, <laughs> at, at the same time, it, it was not all pain. So like this using the new layout thing and um, uh, some other stuff, like uh, it was cool. Okay, yeah. nice, nice, nice. Any other features that you liked? Because it's true, you know, we've been trashing uh, <laughs> and it's probably not that bad. So so the layouts were great. Anything else that uh, enjoyed working with? Um, uh, what can I say? The next 12 are layered. Okay, well, I'm not as raw as the yeah. next 13, because yeah. now you, are, uh, you can have different layers for components, and you before had one layer for all the app, mm -hmm. and now you can have like 
layout inside the layout inside the layout, but we don't use that. So <laughs> no, I guess what is also cool is that by default it, it's a server side app, but mm -hmm. if you need to do a client component, you just tell that okay, this component is client, and that's just fine. That was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Nice. So yeah, mixed reactions towards uh, next uh, next uh, thing, I guess for the most part because it is so complicated to find uh, answers to problems, right? Mm -hmm. More than anything. So. So yeah, hopefully bright future ahead for next 13. Um, all right, then moving on to a different topic, still staying on staying on the front ends. You had a really cool, you know, the visuals in the app were really cool. How did you make that happen? Your CSS, uh, any component libraries? Some inspiration came from the official side. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> implementation. We still need to make it happen yourself. So yeah, yeah. Tell me. Uh, uh -huh. But and not only. So not only. It's a mix of um, CSS and and uh, things. Okay. And how did you how did you decide uh, what you know what goes in the CSS? What was what goes in Tell me? Was it a conscious decision or more of Needing to achieve a result and going for that. Why it doesn't work on Tailwind goes into, into the CSF. Okay, that's <laughs> as simple as that. And then we have this uh, headless UI animation library uh -huh. that works hand on hand with uh, Tailwind, so it's very convenient. Uh huh. You have the characters that appear. Okay, goes so, away. So it's a mix of libraries, yes, bare CSS and uh, Tailwind. Nice. Hopefully. Nice. And by the way, yes, the application is also a responsive. So it looks beautiful both web and, and mobile, all right? Um, and finally, of course, you decided to explore the world of scraping and using Puppeteer for it. Uh, how was how was that experience? And yeah, any um, any highlights from, from the world of scraping? <laughs> yeah, it started quite cool. Felt like we were planning at uh, least uh, and uh, felt a bit like a hacker. <laughs> and actually, the first steps were quite easy. So we're confident that like, two days and we have all the data. So it turned out to be a bit different. Um, but I want to say this bar where we compare the moves is a very complex piece of software. I agree. It's mainly Ardo's work. And one reason is that on the way we found a lot of edge cases like every day we stumbled about values or things they were different because i'm not yeah. moves is close to 2000 at the moment yeah it's um 19 characters and we have to pass three urls for every character and every character has a uh, minimum of 80 moves and then there are uh, another two move categories and yeah and the uh, work with puppeteer i wish i had a bit more time to play around with it because um it took a lot of time just to collect the data and crawl through the page um spend a lot of time in the dev tools Click the selectors. Um, you have to consider the event loop. So you spend time in the network tab and um, some things with Puppeteer. So it can run in the background as um, a headless browser. It opens a browser and then it runs a Java, um, JavaScript file to pass the page. Um, but you cannot get all the data, all the values. You cannot access everything when it's headless. So sometimes you have to open um, a browser window, jump over a cookie or something like that. It's an interesting world. And um, it's the first steps are quite easy. So it's fun to play around with. But I ended up to spend yeah, most of the project time actually on the Scraping thing, yeah. He's the bucket guy. <laughs> um, yeah, and yeah, I don't know, Arco, do you want to comment a little bit on that bar? Because indeed, I think every other day that I stop by to see how this team is doing and seeing what is everyone up to, half the time Arco's answer is uh, the comparison bar. So, 
Yeah, I spent a lot of, the, of my time in bars. Um, <laughs> First, <laughs> what, 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 you use the library there, right? Yeah, I, I first start, started the chart JS, and then uh, I wasn't able to make it look the way I wanted. So back to the drawing board and then ended up with the read charts, which is another chart library. And then from there, it's still a lot of tweaking, and especially when it comes to like hundreds of details. Yeah, that's why, yeah, I spent a lot of time in bars. Beautiful. I think once again, this team definitely went for uh, for the depth instead of breadth of features. So, so yeah, um, really awesome work. So, congratulations. All right, and yeah, that's all. That's all from my side. Back to you, Don mm. said. Yeah. Yeah, no, the, the bar was super impressive when you were demoing it. I was like, well, that's that's nice. You can tell that a lot of time went into that. I think we have a question on the Barcelona campus. Hello, yes. First of all, massive well done for the project. It looks amazing. Uh, it's super impressive. I uh, just wanted to ask, so you mentioned that whenever there's an update on the Capcom website, your database would update accordingly. And uh, could you just, uh, explain a bit how the process works. Well, actually, we have to do it manually. We're not that far yet. It, that would be amazing <laughs> to have a listener and uh, see whatever there is. Don't think it runs automatically. Um, at the moment, it's just your access, your um, access um, and secure endpoint and start the script and then it runs, it flows like a river from the scraping up seats uh, the data into the database. What about how long does the whole process take? The whole process takes um, maybe two to three minutes. Okay. That's a very interesting feature. Uh, again, massive well done. Yeah, no, super cool. Very, very good until Capcom decide to change the layout of their website and then suddenly your entire <laughs> scraper breaks and you have to rebuild it. <laughs> but that's a that's a problem for further down the road. Uh, okay, do we have any more questions for this group in Berlin? Uh, last chance, raise your hand if you have anything. Yes, we have a question here from Berlin. Oh, yes, hiding behind. Go um, for it. Uh, I was wondering, like, uh, why you went for deploying first? Uh, for me, it kind of seems like like not the thing you would go for first, like some set it up, like why you went for, yeah, just deploying first and then building on top of that, like what's the, the thought process behind it? My thought process behind that was I wanted to be deployed the day we do the presentation so I can put in the video, go to this URL and try our app. <laughs> that was my thought process. <laughs> just the... Effect. Also, we have awesome uh, tutors and, and, and uh, um, other people who told us it's it's good. Uh, I heard at least one story from Seb about uh, yeah. <laughs> deploying in the last minute uh, and it being horrible. So it, it, it saved us, I think. Okay. I Go for it. <laughs> so I got a follow up question. Um, uh, and you did. I know you did the continuous deployment because you're sitting behind me. <laughs> um, how did you implement that? Like, uh, what challenges did you face like uh, doing this? For Nessie, yes, uh, it's super easy. You just need to create a personal account and link the GitHub repo, and it does it automatically. For the backend, uh, we had to do a continuous deployment script, and I just follow the set lecture to do it in flight of the scale, so it was pretty easy. Thank you, sir. <laughs> nice. Yes, All right. <laughs> do we have any last questions before we wrap it up? I have a I have a point which is just simply that those animations were so slick, you've almost convinced me to start using Tailwind. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have converted the unconvertible. <laughs> But seriously, it looked amazing. Very cool. I love the style of the app. And David Kaker. Oh, yeah. We would like to know who are your favorite Street Fighter characters? Billionaire. Luke. Luke. Nice. 
Yeah, thank you. No, what? I, I take Blanca. Blanca. <laughs> cool. <laughs> and it might be nice maybe to just say you know like i can in my head maybe imagine some technical problems that came up with maybe some things like how having all these super nice high-res images and maybe you realize you know they were potentially slowing down the app a little bit or like were there unforeseen issues that sort of came up as you went and what were some of the more interesting things you sort of learned that might be fun for the juniors to hear that were just sort of surprises that you had to just battle through and solve over the project? Yeah, using Next, careful with uh, dynamic routes and images uh, because it messes up with the server-side rendering. So if the route is not there when the application uh, pre-renders from the server-side, it's not gonna be there when it shows. Wow. That's what's the problem that we have with the server-side rendering and the images. So I'm sure was, all the juniors oh, hearing that problem are, are, are quaking in their <laughs> boots. That is an advanced problem to be dealing <laughs> with, but you solved it well, well done. Yeah. Nice, good stuff. All right, well, I think that's a good note to finish on there. So everybody, can we do one more round of applause for this group in Berlin and all of the seniors? Amazing projects as always. Well done, everybody. Um, so that's, so that's, right, that's really everything. That's, uh, that's everything we have for you today. So uh, seniors, well done. Uh, go and have a drink or have a sleep or whatever it is you feel like you need to do now. Um, and then tomorrow you're going to be right back at it with your uh, your job search stuff, I think. Uh, juniors, I hope that, would, that provided some inspiration uh, for your thesis projects, which you're going to be tackling in just a few weeks. Uh, anybody who's still uh, watching us on YouTube, congratulations for making it this far. Uh, just as a reminder, these were the thesis projects that our senior students have spent the last two weeks building. So all of that stuff you just saw was built by groups of three and four people in two weeks, which hopefully you'll agree is pretty impressive. Um, but that's it. Let's wrap it up there. Let's let everybody uh, go to the bathroom and have some dinner. But thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, and we will see